Good morning. As I mentioned in our circle, my name is Terrell. And what I'd like to do with you this morning is take you through a step-by-step -step process for the developing a community of learners. It's the beginning of the process. It's important to realize that in developing a community in your classroom, that it's more than just this lesson or this process. The, the idea of a community, the idea that we're all learners, we're all teachers, has to be embedded throughout everything that you do for your children to truly feel that they're a member of the community. So the process, there is a copy of it in your agenda, a step-by-step. -step. What I'm going to do today will probably be a little bit different. It will also be available on the e-folder that um, you can access later. When you go back to your schools, if you're teaching an older group, an upper um, primary, um, intermediate group. You might be doing this um, process with your class and then once your class has dis established their community of learners, a beautiful way to send that out into the school to create a school community of learners is to have older children um, coach younger children through the process. And that's how Mary Lynn and I have done it at um, our school. She um, last year taught a grade four or five, and so her and I, we did some co-teaching for the community of learners, and then um, her group, we had buddied up so that we had coaches, and the older children in grade four or five um, coached my children in grade th three through this process. And it was interesting because um, in our coaching buddy program, we gave the students opportunities where the older children were sometimes the, the coaches and at other times the younger children were sharing their expertise and they were the coaches. And then what was really heartwarming for me at the end of near the end of the year when we were talking in my class of grade threes about how we could make a difference as a community of learners. It was very evident, the excitement, when one of the students said, why don't we teach another class how to be a community of learners? And so we were invited into a grade two class and my students some taught them how to become a community of learners. So there are many different ways in which you can spread this um, process throughout your school. Now what we usually do at the beginning is um, we establish the background knowledge as to what our students know and understand about what is a community. And you can do that in a variety of ways. It can be when you're still in your circle because that's an important part of the process that you start with that circle. Then you can talk to the students and ask them, what is a community? It can be as a whole class. It could be if you already have your students in working groups. And um, you can just chart, write down their ideas of what they think a community is, what a community is. And then you lead into, well, if that's what a community is, then what is a community of learners? What are your ideas there? and you may um, get some responses verbally, but what we try and encourage within each group is that they draw a picture of a community of learners. And we focus on when you draw that picture, talk first with your group about your ideas. So share your ideas before you put down your pictures, and then you draw the community of learners that you see, you hear, and feel what the feelings would be if you're a member of a community of learners. And the teacher or the facilitator, and often it's um, two people, we um, involve your EA in the process. We're going around and looking at the, and listening to the children's ideas, looking at um, their artwork and what they've done as far as their drawings. And we also ask them to zoom in and add dialogue bubbles, speaking bubbles. So what are, in this picture, you've got these two kids sitting here side by side. What are they saying? Or you've got this little girl over here, and she's got her hand. 
or arm around another student's shoulder. So what are they thinking? So draw some thinking bubbles. So you really get them to focus in on not just the drawing, but the drawing that represents a community and what are they seeing in that community, what are they hearing in that community, the words they would hear in the community, and the feelings they would have as a member of a community. So right now, I'm fast-tracking you through this process. What I'd like you to do with your team, and I've given you two pieces of papers because some of the groups are rather large. I'd like you to draw, and you've got lots of felts there, what you think a community of learners is. What does it look like? What would it feel like? What would it sound like? So I'm going to give you about five to seven minutes to get your ideas down on paper. So talk with your group first, and then you'll probably all be drawing, writing at the same time. So have some fun. All right. So I'm going to eat it. So what does the community of learners look like, smell like, act like, sound like? It's like, we only have one color. It smells like strawberries. What do you got a dog on your nose now? I think the circle is the place to begin. So I think we began with the circle because we're all learning together. We're all listening to each other, respecting each other. Yeah. And a circle? Yeah. Okay. Circle thing. Busy. We have engaged. And then a rectangle face. So are we putting like kids sitting or standing or, or are they kids or are they us? And, and sort of acknowledging and owning, okay, you know what, I'm not in a great space today or, you know, allowing for people to have different ways of thinking and being. And valued. The safety often looks like uh, laughter. Yeah, it does, uh, yeah. You know, close proximity. And that's the way kids show that they feel safe. Kids that, that they feel like they are reflected in, in your, your big ideas that you're trying to get across. So it'd be nice to get the red. So getting to know the students really well and making sure that, that they have a chance to lead about where where they might go with their learning. Mm -hmm. That makes them uh, feel like they belong. I mean, schools are about partnerships now, right? I mean, they're partnerships with among staffs and among administration and among community and among elders. So it's really seen as a back, you know, back and forth partnership that everybody has something to offer. The sharing of learning, that mm -hmm. celebration that allows for that sharing of being and acknowledgement. Yeah, uh, the sharing of yeah. it right away yeah. says yeah. that it's valuable. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. That because, yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. 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 Building of relevance as well, that notion of uh, this is important to me, this is something I want to make meaning, you know, give meaning to. It becomes important to the learner, not to just it's, yeah. everybody being included, like it's an inclusive concept, but that means too that there really is a way for all the learners to be successful. So unless, unless that every child in the room has some vehicle, some way to sit, celebrate that I'm a learner too, then they won't feel that's it's so important that they every single one of the kids. Uh, what are we missing, Brian? Thanks, Ryan. Being heard. Every voice is heard in a community. That's important. Yeah, and uh, I was trying to think about the respect. We were talking about respect. How do we show that? How do we, what does it look like? What does it sound like? But, uh, that's a good question. How do you explain respect? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to model it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the teacher has a role, yeah. and the students have a role, and the community has a role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, first and foremost, the teacher is the first learner in the classroom. They, they have to show that they're always learning how to be respectful too, and self taught that experience about learning how to to feel welcome and to have good manners and all the all of the structure that's needed to to make someone feel welcome and comfortable. Thank you. Think if you were doing this in your class and you've got your children working in groups and how exciting it would be to walk around and listen to what they have to say. 
and look at how they've represented their ideas. Um, what I'd like to do is um, have one person from each group just share one of their ideas. And what we do when we're going through the process with our students, we ask, we usually have the whole group because our groups are usually um, three to five maximum. And they will come up and they will bring their picture of their community of learners. And we give them a little bit of time to decide, okay, I'm going to hold, I'm going to hold, and I'm going to talk, and you're going to talk, to organize their presentation. And they come up and they present their ideas to the entire class. So what I'd like you to do is just um, one person maybe share one idea. What I ask my students is, Focus in on something you think is really unique, that idea that your group is really proud of, that you think nobody else may have. So who would like to start? Just anyone from any group. What was one of your ideas about what a community of learners looks like? Yes. Um, with ours, we started with the circle, because with the circular table, or like with the circle we had earlier, we're all equal. And then we got. Um, I'll stop there. We started with the idea of the circle, and we all look to each other and learn from each other, and we're all equal. Very nice. Thank you. I love that idea that you've represented the equality, that you're all equal, because in a community, that is the, that's the sense you want to develop. You may, and what I'm doing is providing here some descriptive feedback, which you would do with your kids. If it's appropriate, you might want to say you could add something or you could build on that idea. How could you build on it and focus in on something else that's really important? So that descriptive feedback component is important to the teaching. Could someone from this table here just give us a... Show us your representation and one idea. Um, <clears throat> so lots of um, uh, picture symbolism going on, but also some, we jotted down some thoughts as well. And one of the ones that stood out, I think, for a lot of us, for all of us, is just that active li listening piece. That how can you be a community of learners without active listening? And that's something that we have to teach. Okay, and how you might see that represented with students in their drawing. They just may have two stick figures, like sort of face to face, looking at each other to symbolize that eye contact is important when you're listening, or they just might draw an ear, but they're talking about the importance of listening. This group back here, would you show us your representation and one idea? The connectedness. The connectedness within the community. Okay. And that connectedness, you can see how you can tie all of these ideas together, having a connected community that where everyone is equal partners and they all listen and share together. <clears throat> what about the group at the back here? Would you show us your representation? Okay. Oh, okay. um, we have quite a few things on here, but the one I re one suggestion I really liked was uh, one of our groups said safety. And to me, you can't do anything if you're afraid. You can't learn. You can't do anything. So you gotta feel safety. You gotta feel like you belong. So to me, that's a big one. Okay. So you can see how um, creating that safe environment within a community. If you don't do that, you're not going to have a community. Thank you, Brian. In this group here, Gary, thanks. Uh, our group, as you can see, they have uh, questions over their heads. Uh, they're not confused. Uh, they're, we're all asking questions, and not, not just the teacher or the friend. And we spend a lot of time talking about what if a, a child's having a bad day, and how sometimes somebody might need to be out of the group a little bit, and that this guy is trying to get them to join in when they're ready, so that they're, they're being respectful of somebody's need for space or time away or time to be apart, but wanting them to be back with the group when they're able to be. Thank you, Gary and Diane. I love that idea of the questioning 
and it's um, not just with the teacher but within the community and that goes back to what we you know one of our guiding principles we are all learners we're all teachers and that ability within a community to sense it's not always going to be happy wonderful times we're not always going to be together so there might be a day when there's someone in the class that for their own reason they want some space and your children are exhibiting a true community when they can respect that. So important. And over here, show us, oh we got two. Mm -hmm. okay, so being a little bit later, I think we're repeating a lot of other things, but because we also had safety net on ours, but this one perhaps took, uh, we had a lot of discussion, open door. So it was similar to a different groups in the sense that we thought it should be equality so everybody can, can come in and be inclusive, but the same reason if somebody was having a bad day or, or just didn't, couldn't handle being a community of learners, they could also exit and then come back in. So we had the open door on there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. That idea of inclusion with children, you'll all, all, often see them re represent that idea with um, drawing a picture of some kids in a group and one to the side and they're saying things like, do you want to come and play with us? Okay, very nice. And I love that, the non-judgment as well. And the other group. Our new teachers saw nothing but smiling faces. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. That was so good. <laughs> but uh, one thing that came out in our group with, with Marnie, she actually worked in my class and one of the things that I always say in my class is to take a healthy risk. And I think to build a community of learners is to make sure that they are willing to try something new that isn't actually going to hurt them and, and is quite healthy, but just to, to add that risk to their little community. Thank you. The representations, it's wonderful to see the variety in the representations, but the, um, the common elements that are woven throughout. When the children do this activity, there will be far fewer words than what you have, and there will definitely be more pictures. And I'd like to give an example from this group here, because I heard them t talking about healthy risk-taking, and I just love that because I've seen children draw that. They don't have that vocabulary, but what they draw is a picture of two kids, and they've got speech bubbles, and one kid will be saying, I don't know if I can do it, and the other kid is saying, yes, you can, I'll help you. You know, and that's, again, you know, when you hear, when kids represent that, or when you see it in your class, um, you know that you have your community of learners. Now what I would do at this point with the students after they have shared out, I would give them an opportunity to take advantage of the descriptive feedback <coughs> and an opportunity um, of having their focused listening and learning from the other groups and I'd give them some time to go back and add more information to their pictures based on the feedback, based on if they liked an idea that somebody else had being able to share that and put it down. I'm not going to do that with you because I think with your representation, you've used a lot of words. And so we're going to go to the next part of the activity that I would do with the kids. In their groups, I'd say, okay, turn over your paper. And I want you now to list, based on your picture and everything that you've heard from our group, I want you to list those attributes or characteristics that would describe a community of learners. So as an example, over here, if you had that picture of the two kids, I don't think I can do it, and yes, you can, I'll be there for you, then that might be in the characteristic or attribute. You just might put risk-taking being able to do that. So would you now take your ideas and on the back, just write down some of the words that are characteristics of a community of learners.
Okay, so we're in. We'll do it like we do in coach teaching. Will you do the chart for me? Flexible. So if they say safety, I'll say okay. Uh, uh, safe. Have a right to so think about words you would hear in a community of learners as well. Your words, and we talk about well, where would that fit in? Look like, feel like, sound like. So we're just going to do a bit of that process. And this group at the back here, very intuitive. They just jumped right into it, right? Yeah, I love the symbolism. So who would like to give us some of their ideas and we'll categorize them on our Y chart? Yes, Taz. So we put for what it feels like, it feels safe, it feels harmonious, it feels trustworthy, it looks respectful. It looks like active listening. It sounds non judgmental. And I think it's cooperation. I think it would fall under all three. So you might, we might put that in kid language looks like working together <laughs> and sharing. Okay. Any other ideas? Yes. I think one of the big ones for us, um, just hearing those I statements from our kids. I feel such and such when. Okay. So um, that would be under sounds like, and that's a big part of the communication, be willing to share how they feel. I feel, I want, I need. Any other ideas? Want to share? Anything more for the feel like? How would you feel in a community of learners? How would your students feel? Energized. Comfortable. Oh, comfortable. Okay. Energized. And happy. That's the kind. Those are the words you would get. Yeah, from your kids. Connected. Connected. Yeah, if you were um, listening to your children do this activity for the sound like, what kind of words would they be giving you? If I'm a member of a community of learners, these are words I'm going to hear. What kind of words would they say? Taz? Thank you. Usually we say these manners. Yeah, good manner words. Oh, thank you. Compliments. And how to accept the compliments. Even better. Yep. And accepting compliments. Can I, I'm just wondering, as soon as marks come in on the, if this is unmarked, I see this happening quite successfully in classrooms, especially primary. But I see in the older classrooms where they have marks allocated, then things change. I don't think you get nearly as much of this happening. Especially if they don't get to pick their groups. Yes. So I'm just wondering how that dynamic goes. So you're saying when they do this, like marked on this process? Like if they're suddenly saying they're doing an activity and it's worth certain marks, then I hear different conversations. Right. Well, I, I kind of take away that whole mark yeah. thing and it's all about feedback. And I, there's no marks. That's what I'm just questioning. Yeah. Yes. Because I see, what, I'm a teacher librarian, so I see all grades and all. Yes. I think when you look at sort of the non judgmental, mm -hmm. we're accepting everyone's ideas and, um, you know, with our kids, that's never come up that it would be like a marked assignment. As soon as you put marked, that's going to Yeah, change. yeah, oh, it yeah. will. Yeah. It will. So you might say with the compliments, or you might say start using the word feedback is another one that you might want to put in because that's going to try, you're going to try and move that in to in place of the marks scenario. It's the feedback that moves you forward with your learning. And it's far less threatening than a number and far more meaningful 
than a number because you know what to do next. And Marianne, is this not like this process is about setting up your classroom as learners? It's yes. not about a specific assignment, right? Perfect. This is about how do we set a, an atmosphere in our classroom that is all about learning, mm -hmm. as opposed to how do I do this activity? It's it's, a, it's a more of a global way of thinking. We can assess this activity as learners based on the criteria we're forming ourselves and say, I don't feel like it's working today. I feel really hurt and upset by somebody over here. So I, I think I need to go take care of this. And that feeling of regulating your class and your environment, you can't, the children do this using their criteria. Um, and then that just leads us into really our direction with formative assessment, right? We're trying to um, move from an actual mark to this is where I am based on my criteria, and this is where I would like to go. Now, you know, I know especially have, being an intermediate teacher and having taught secondary that can be like, oh, wait a minute here. I still got to be accountable for the report cards. You know, I understand that mindset. <coughs> so what you might want to do, just to scaffold yourself around that, you could, if you need to, you could put a mark somewhere in your book or wherever you want to put it so that you have sort of some um, monitoring of how it's going. Now, it's not going to be... <coughs> 27 out of 30, but you might start using your rubrics to sort of think about, well, this is an exceed, this is a fully meets, and ballpark the kind of progression that you're seeing. And we have a rubric that um, we don't have time to share today, but we're going to share tomorrow, an engagement rubric. So you can do that assessment of your student's engagement, and it would work perfectly for this type of activity. So once you've collected all of your students' ideas under the categories of the look like, feel like, sound like, then you have to start the talk about a value system. How can we organize these, these ideas to represent our value system? And we have, um, some schools have like the three R's. It might already be in place, so you might be using that, or the three C's. We've um, taken on what we call the four C's. And so we talked to our students about how we could take the words, that four words that start with C, and we could probably fit all their ideas under those categories. And so in our classrooms, we've used the four C's, cooperation, communication, commitment, and control. So what we then do is ask the kids to, okay, take all of these ideas, and they would do it on a, a half a piece of chart paper, and have your four columns, your four C's, and then have them sort their ideas. Is this communication? Listening, yeah, that's in communication. Sharing, where does that come under? Probably cooperation. Um, being focused on your work, where is that? Under your commitment. So we have them categorize the, their ideas under the, the values that we have agreed to. So in our case, it's the four C's. And then, what I do with my kids, I'm sort of a bit of a dramatist and I like to, because um, this process with kids is probably going to go over two days, and so I sort of end my session with saying, okay, I've got all your great ideas, and I take them all in, and I said, I'll write them up into a nifty poster, and then we can have it as a class poster for the entire year. And so I do that, I take all their ideas away, and I might reword a little bit there will be repetition from the groups. And then the next morning when they come in, I have the poster in the middle of the whiteboard, but I've taped it up so they can't see it, and we have the great reveal. <laughs> Here is our criteria for being 
a community of learners. And then what I say to the kids is, we've just begun. And we are going to adopt Paige's analogy of the canoe. And so we've just begun. We've stepped into the canoe. We've sat down. So let's pick up our paddles. And I think that's a beautiful way to um, help the children realize that um, this is not a one-shot deal. This is who we are in our classroom. And so from there, everything that we do is guided by our criteria for the community. And you will, children, what I love is when I hear somebody uh, read where someone's done some peer assessment and they'll say, I really like the way Declan was focused on his work. I mean, what, a, what great feedback for Declan and uh, what, gr what great appreciation for how to be positive and help your peer grow. So we're going to talk later about how we deepen that understanding. What we do as well is bring in that Aboriginal context through everything that we do as well to help support and continue the growth of our community. Now we started that brief conversation on assessment, so I'm going to ask Mary Lynn to take over and she's going to talk about um, the type of assessment, some of the things that we do, and we have a short PowerPoint for you. Thank you. Okay, just, just before I step in, I just, uh, uh, Susan uses the value system also. And just listen to how she, what values she's chosen. And they complement the four C's we've been using. See, but they have more of an Aboriginal grounding to them. That was so great. She read my mind. I can hear her trying to speak. And then Mary Lynn had it. She, she had my back. She's, she's a really positive learner in our community. Um, Wow. The four C's is, is uh, of course, it parallels the traditional values that we use in, uh, in my program that elders have actually met and, and talked about. We've talked about what's important for our children to learn about and to know in the classroom. And listening was the number one value listening was also uh, an Aboriginal gift. So listening would be a huge value that we would want to model, facilitate, um, honor, and respect in the classroom. Um, mutual respect. Respect for uh, all of us, for all living things, for our planet. Um, respect for life. And it, it's crucial, it's vital. Um, cooperation and collaboration. We work so much better as a team, as a community. Our minds together are far more powerful. And the fourth value that we use um, are speak is speaking from the heart. And this is the one that talks or speaks to the truth and honesty and character. If the words that, are, that the children speak to each other, the way they speak to each other, if those words come from the heart, then they're okay. Even if they're words we don't want to hear because it's that child's truth and it is to be heard and respected and honored. What's accompanied with that is, above all else, be kind. There is a kind way to say, I don't appreciate the way that you speak about me every time I walk by. I spoke my truth, and it's uncomfortable, but I spoke from the heart. 
And I, you know, I'm just. <laughs> and and that that's a process and a value that that is honored. So in your communities, um, there will be values, Aboriginal values in the territories that that you're on, that perhaps aren't really spoken about, but that are honored. And um, your Aboriginal support workers in your schools, your um, teachers, Aboriginal teachers who are from the area, they'll, they'll know those kinds of things or you can ask. Or I really inquired and worked with my community for three years, went to reserve, um, met with elders. Um, nobody knew who I was in my community. I came from a different nation. I didn't come from Comox people. It took me many years to develop relationship with community and to have these kinds of conversations. But they're so powerful once you've developed those relationships with your community. So by all means, the four C's, it's speaking the same language, just in a different way. We're saying you find the, the values in your classroom, in your place of learning. There's, there's one other component that I don't see covered here that I'm, because I've taught 30 years and I've been uh, working with a lot of gifted kids, I'm looking at all this and for the majority of people, I would say this is, a, you know, great and it all fits, it all makes total sense. But when it, if ever if any of you have been to a gifted retreat or a challenge day, you'll know that kids that are truly gifted cannot work together with beings generally because they are so intense on their knowledge, that they really have to learn these skills. It's, it's a real challenge for these super high gifted kids. I work with them in the library on certain projects, and you get the odd one, phenomenal one who has good social skills, but it's not the norm. So I'm looking at that thinking as well. There's, there is a component of our population, our students, that would really have a challenge with it. And I'm up to any kind of ideas, but I know Challenge days, oh, they are, they are challenge days when these kids have a really hard time working in groups and together. Part, part of my background is enrichment gifted. Yeah. I, for many years, I've worked with those kinds of students. I know exactly what you're saying. They have trouble with this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, and they're usually the most difficult to move, believe it or not, in this, when you start working as a community. But once they understand it and once they learn it, they embrace it wholeheartedly and they actually transform. If you go to Judy and Linda's website and you listen to, there's one girl in particular on there I would say is pretty much gifted, but she wanted no part of this and neither did her parents at the beginning of the year. And um, by the end of the year, she, gives testimony to her transformation. And she says, I have changed. I am far more confident. I feel like I can work with anyone now and that they're just like me. And you can hear her words and that's exactly what happens. And they, they are the ones that struggle the most with this because they're used to saying, this is my work. I know my, this is the way they believe. My work is better, but this, this is how they begin to look at other people's perspectives. And if they're really going to make a difference in the world as gifted people are trying, we're trying to encourage them to do, they need to know how to work with others. It's no, it's no different than a learner who is struggling with reading and writing. They've got to learn to overcome those obstacles, mm -hmm. just like the gifted kids need to overcome their obstacles. And, uh, this is a service for everyone. So, and it's a journey. It's the canoe. <laughs> and we're getting in. <laughs> so, um, we're going to go back to that whole ass assessment thing. There's three ways that, that we found to really deepen this whole community of learners concept. And one way is through the ongoing assessment for learning practice. The second way is through rich resources that explicitly teach the values. And the third way is through, and that's not up there, but through embedded inquiry. 
when you start using community of learners embedded into your inquiry questions, it gives students that foundation of background knowledge to enter into each learning experience because they have that understanding to step into the new learning opportunity with. So it, it really works to making that bridge that you're always trying to do. How do we create background knowledge? So that's the third way. So let's look at um, the learning intentions. So this, this was your learning, this is our big learning intention here as a community of learners in this room. And you can see how we've made that connection with the first piece. And so now when you're taking it to your room, your learning is, intention is how do we become a stronger community of learners by practicing whatever value, values you choose. For us it was the four C's, for Susan it's something else, and for you it will be what you choose. But it's really probably important to have some continuity in your school around that so that you're, each year you're having that transfer of this is where we come from, we are just moving forward and we're grounded in this together and they begin to embrace that and we've seen that as younger students come into my room having been into Terrell's room and so on we're starting to see that bridge and they act as peer coaches those ones who've had that background knowledge when they come into your room so you always have that sort of scaffolding it, it saves you a lot of energy and it provides students a lot of comfort so that's kind of your learning intention. So if I'm going to break that down, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to say, okay, boys and girls, I notice we, we really need to be working on cooperation. So let's look at some of those descriptors under cooperation today. And we're really going to focus on that as we engage in our various learning experiences today. So we'll be watching for that. And then we're going to be assessing how we're doing. So it's explicitly telling you this already on your chart. So you're just going back and you're saying, okay, we're looking for cooperation. So now when I set up my structures around partner share, so you might move to the next one. Um, when I set up my um, partner sharing, I'm going to be looking that everybody's cooperating. When I set up my circle conversations, I'm going to have a guided reading group at the back, or I'm going to be taking my let circle group. I'm going to be looking for cooperation as we share ideas and listen to one another's ideas and move us to a new understanding. And uh, when you're making your values, you see how we have only four. Don't create more than five because you'll get, they'll get all mixed up. Even in primary, you, you know, three would be fine. So no more than, you want that three to five range, no more. And this becomes sort of your detailed criteria all the time. So when I have a student who is not showing so much commitment in their work, I'm saying, so how do you think we're doing with the four C's here? Do you see any of those that might be falling apart right now? Or what's going well? Where you go, you know, what is it needs some work? And then they say, well, I guess I'm not showing much commitment. And I say, well, what makes you think that? Why would anybody be thinking that? Well, I'm not doing my work. So then what do we need to do to move you to that next step so that you're starting to use some commitment here? And so the ownership is on them. And the ownership is also on the group. The group takes ownership when someone is struggling. So I'll have students say, just like Terrell mentioned, where they'll say, uh, if I ask a student a question and he's not giving an answer, I've had that bright student say, well, Mrs. Mrs. Epps, they'll come up quietly and they've tapped me on my shoulder and said, he's actually got the word there. I can help him show where it is. And so he, she pointed to it and then he could answer. So, and I'd go back and we'd give that child a chance. So that's really where it ends up being. Everybody takes care of one another. 
And that sense of safety, trust, and support is always there. It's not just me, if I get my good marks, I've jumped the hoop, I'm out of here. We want to get rid of that. Learning is an ongoing, lifelong process. Can I just uh, remind you of the time when you had a student give feedback about the, their experiences of being part of this learning community? And uh, she so succinctly said, the student just came out and said, even if, she was a grade 7 student, even if they don't use these strategies, and even if we don't have Meredith and Mrs. Epps teaching us, it doesn't matter because I, I can take this anywhere and I'll, I'll use it no matter what. That was just such a statement of confidence that they could go forward in, in any setting and, um, and have the tools that they need. And it was probably one of the most profound statements I ever heard a student say. That they so owned the strategies that you've been teaching them that they, yeah. they're out there and they're confident. You know, and, and Lynn's doing this at the secondary level. The pattern of what these kids are saying is exactly the same in every <laughs> one of our classrooms that's doing this. That's what makes it so interesting. Like, okay, how does that happen? This is obviously making a difference if we're all hearing the same feedback from students about their learning and what they're doing with it, taking it throughout their whole life. So, like they're saying, I'm using it in dance club after school. I'm, Lynn had one where they said, I'm going to take it to my job but on how we work at staff meetings or whatever. <laughs> and then you, so they take it everywhere. So they take it out on the playground. Mm -hmm. So, and they do noon hour games using the four C's. We take it into PE. We take it into, it's in everything we do. Every single thing we do. One of the little subtle differences that we've been using a little bit at Bayview is rather than a community of learners, we've been looking at a community of learning which is a, just a little bit of a difference, but that way for those kids that feel they don't have a lot to contribute, it's the focus is on the learning versus I have to be a perfect learner. And that's been kind of new too. You know, we've got a little different acronym, but um, it's a subtle difference, but for a lot of kids that it, it seems to sort of take a little bit of pressure off. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, same thing. Yeah. So a little variation you all get the same kind of results. It's the process that makes the difference and you feeding up, you know, keep feeding back to that. So, yeah, so these are, the, these are the ways that we do the feedback, two stars. So at the end of the day, you come back in your circle. Two stars are how we were a community of learners today. One next step for us tomorrow. You could do it at intermediate. I don't know if I would do it every day. But I would do, I do it at, you know, the circle part, but I would do it at the beginning of the year, the beginning of the day, and the end of the day to start with, maybe for the first month, and then start scaffolding the less time of that. You could probably get away with doing your circle once a week. Start Monday morning and then end Friday with that. But give the feedback all along the way. So how did we do? You can do it as individuals. You could do it as whole group. And I think on your sticks, there are some two stars next step sheets that you can use quickly for that. The page is made up, and we've just used those. And those become then, so how are we doing in that social responsibility or engagement? You're going to see an engagement rubric that we've been using that helps us uh, sort of have a bigger look at what our community of learners is like in September and where we go at the end of the year. Okay, uh, so let's try the next one. So that's, um, that's where we're going with our goals. Your next step is basically your goal, where you're going next with reinforcing that community of learners. So now I think we'll jump to some resources that we're using. I'll start with the ones that, um, if we're talking about literacy, it's great to be talking about books. <laughs> so at Intermediate, these, were, these are some great books that we've been using. I usually start out with, well, Terrell will show you one book that we, we've been using a lot, but this is a great, 
Aboriginal book to sort of start with that value, know yourself. So I, we create an inquiry question in September. Terrell and I have been using this one for a while. Um, how can we support our, us developing as a community of learners using the Aboriginal values to guide our way, something like that. And uh, so then we start delving into the literature that would explicitly teach those values. And so how does Know Yourself fit into our four C's? Well, when we, when we know what strengths we have to bring to the table, to the learning table, we can begin to share with, share with others around that. So that's part of cooper could fit into your cooperation. So that's one book, and if you see, see that, that um, Grey Wolf Search. And if you see the image here, that um, sort of uh, spirit helper image that's there, that was sort of the inspiration to this community of learners mural, where you see all our, our um, images. And then Terrell has another book we used for that. And then we, so I usually have a book bin because I'm teaching intermediate and I have lots, lots of different books at lots of different levels, both fiction and nonfiction we're using. So this is, um, I don't know if you guys have seen these ones, but this, this is a great uh, series. My kids just loved it. And uh, the author here is great at responding. If you're wanting to Skype her in, we did an interview with her. Um, one of the couple of girls decided that that was their personal inquiry. They wanted to find out more about their, the, this author and her experience at residential school and how that's impacted her life. So they went through, they really delved deeply into those literacy skills as questioning to try and get at that information. And that's where one of my gifted kids really began to blossom because she was quite um, introverted about not sharing and not speaking in public. And she did this because she was in so inspired by this book and what she learned about it from residential school and whatnot and how it affected Fatty Lakes and a Stranger at Home. Oh no, the, you're getting a memory stick with different things on it. I don't have these on memory stick, but we can, your coach will bring this stuff, okay. kind of stuff to talk you to when Jerry. we visit. Tracy, talk to Tracy. Um, well, Margaret, Margaret is the Fatty Legs character, and the author is her daughter-in-law, and her daughter-in-law is a writer, so they're telling her story. And when we Skyped her in, it was just so fantastic. Because what they did, what we did on the screen, it wasn't just the author who comes to your school, like you have in real life. We actually were zoomed into her own family setting. And the granddaughter was sitting on Margaret's lap. Well, and the author was beside her, her daughter-in-law. And they talked together as a family unit. What could be better than that to see that authenticity of the importance of family in an Aboriginal setting, right? It was just so moving. It was unbelievable. <laughs> okay, so they're, they're going to share a couple other books. One of the books that I use with my students is um, Yetz's Sweater. Mm -hmm. And when I'm using this book, I introduce the Coast Salish values of respect for elders, listening, cooperation, sharing, non-interference, extended family, and know yourself. And I, I developed a whole lesson sequence around this book that probably, you know, you could do over a week or a two-week period. But one of the activities that I have the students do is looking at the um, values and then looking for examples of those values in the book. And this is a beautiful book because all of the values are there. And so it's very easy for, for the students to pick out an example of non-interference in the book where you respect the property of others. She's not going to touch her grandmother's loom. 
So this is an excellent book for that. What I did was I took it further once they had located their um, values, the values in the book, I asked them to compare their family values and that became part of the inquiry question. How are your family values similar and different to those of the Coast Salish people? So they did a T-chart to um, do the comparison and then they did a write on um, on the, the comparison, the similarities and the differences. And I've done this at um, grade grade three, grade four, and grade five. When I did it at um, the grade four, five level, it was the year that um, the Olympic uniform came out for Vancouver, and it included the Cowichan style sweater, and there was a lot of controversy created around that. So we talked a lot about respect of ownership and tied that into our, um, our talk about respecting people and respecting ownership of objects and symbols. So I'd highly recommend um, Yetz's sweater. Um, Sylvia Olson, if you don't know her, is from the Cowichan Valley. That was a 2009 Chocolate Lily Award. It was on the list and it hardly got any points or votes. And Sylvia and I have talked about it. We think it's to do with the coverts and it's a really great book. And once you read it to the kids, they almost all love it. But they, for some reason, there's something about the cover that they don't necessarily take it. So she might be changing the cover, she told me. But it's a great book. So there's that one. When Mary Lynn and I establish our community of learners, that one of the next things that we do to embed that Aboriginal content is have um, our students look at um, different Aboriginal totem animals and look at the characteristics of those animals and see if they want to adopt their own personal totem. And this is one of the books that I use, Sharing Our World. Beautiful illustrations, the wolf, the thunderbird, and it gives the characteristics for that totem. And so they identify, and we use other material as well, but they identify with a totem animal. They love the puppets. I have almost all of the puppets for the different totem animals in my classroom. And we use these throughout. It's not just, again, a standalone lesson, you know, I think I'm a wolf. Um, we integrate that into our entire program. We try and do a celebration um, at the end of each term. And so with our celebration at the end of the first term last year, we had our children make totem masks and we also had our students do a totem dance and so they danced representing their animals and then came back into at the end of the celebration into a circle and invited all of the um, attendees to join in the circle dance as they left the um, the gym. So I think it's really important as far as um, embedding that a Aboriginal tradition and culture is to let your children identify. And it also provides wonderful opportunities for story writing and for role playing within the classroom. So those are two of my resources that I use. With little people, Oftentimes when you start the community of, of, of learners, you're talking circles in the morning and whenever there's a conflict in the classroom, one of the students picks up the drum, hits it four times and says, we need to have a talking circle. I have a problem. We'd all gather no matter what we're doing and we talk about it. And the person who has the problem would lead that circle. And no, oh, it's so and so, and I was playing with the Lego. They took the piece I wanted, and and so on, right? The cities are four, five, six, seven year olds. So, and the children really need to resolve that issue before they move forward in their learning community. So we do that. Well, how do you know how to do that? How do the children know that it's not okay to snatch that Lego piece? I saw it, I wanted it. Right? Well, that's not okay. How do you know that? So I read a lot of stories about um, what it might look like and feel like to be with a kind friend. And what are the characteristics of a friend? And how do you be a friend? 
And, of course, to do that, I love Little Bear's Vision Quest. And most of you have probably seen this. This is pretty high level for five-year-olds. So I scale it down. I do a little bit of uh, creative interpretation and read part of the words. <laughs> I'm a part of the pages and I carry and I don't do uh, all of the dialogue in the book. Um, but it does talk about a really mean bear who all of the beautiful you, uh, Northwest Coast design shapes on the bear are cloudy and dark when he's mean-spirited, as you can see here. And as the book progresses, the little bears, Northwest Coast design shapes, lighten up and become white. So what I have to accompany this is I have bears, and they are done in um, cardboard, and they have all of the beautiful designs, U-shapes and ovoids on them. And if a child is playing and is feeling or comes to school feeling unhappy or dark, they, take, they can take one of the bears and color them. And we know that, whoa, somebody's not feeling great today. And then that's when either a child or myself will come over and initiate a conversation or just pick up one of the bears and start coloring them as well. Sometimes we don't even speak. We'll just sit down and join in. So I find this to be really helpful for little people to learn how to be together. Friendship following respectful behavior. Oftentimes, we're not really sure if, if people love us. Mama, do you love me? What happens if I... I'm running in the kitchen and, and I trip and fall and, and I knock over my mom's cup of tea and it falls all over the ground and she screams and now my mom doesn't love me. This story is really, really good at talking about mom's feelings and it could be anybody's feelings, auntie's feelings, dad's feelings, for little people on, oh, I was scared when the tea fell and my face look like this, but I still loved you. And I love you always and forever because you are my dear little one. And this story is fantastic because it gives all of the situations, uh, well, I might be scared. Well, then I would be angry, but I would still love you. Well, then I would be really angry, but I would still love you. So a really, I find this book, the children, I didn't understand how connected they were to it, but they'll ask to be read this over and over and over again. Very powerful story. Um, little people often want to be better. If I could just be like that person over there, everything comes so easily to them. And little duck Sakipsis, he wants to be one of the mighty plain Crees, but he says, I'm a mud duck. And he tries everything to dress up, to dance with the Cree people, but he's a mud duck and he gets stepped on. And it talks about his story of accepting who he is and where he's from and the value that we all are important and worthy and worthy of love and respect. And that little book does that really well. Personal favorite, Red Park and Mary. I story tell with this one without using the book. And I have the little box with white fur and the red heart. And I use all the voices. And actually, this book still makes me cry. But it talks about, isn't it good? <laughs> How many people know this book? Yes. Yes, you feel it, don't you? This book is phenomenal for the older students. Um, any student, but really great for students who may feel uh, afraid of an Aboriginal person the way that an older Aboriginal person might look because they might look different than what they're used to. And this book talks about the things that nobody wants to talk about. People are thinking, but no one's talking. And this talks about Red Park and Mary. 
And this little boy develops a trusting relationship with her. And she has nothing to give him. So she gives him her gift of the greatest value. She gave him her heart. Beautiful story. Tells, tells you so much about the values of respect in Aboriginal community. And of course, I have puppets like Terrell does, and so I, I have a huge raven, and he's the trickster in my classroom, Guawina. And Guawina is constantly um, playing tricks on us. And this book here by George Littlechild, I, A Man Called Raven, talks about how important it is to respect the values uh, in community. And it's about two boys who beat a raven with a hockey stick in a garage. And the raven escapes. And all of a sudden a man appears who walks up to them and addresses the situation with them and says, take me to your parents and sits them down. And the children are accountable for their behavior. Um, and it speaks to the values again. I have many, many books. I have about 300 in my classroom like this. I've got very few, and I know our time is limited, but um, Terry has all of the books. Terry Mack, she has every one of the books that I have, and they're out there, and I think a lot of your coaches will have uh, amazing literature for you. So that's all I'm going to say. I've probably gone over. Okay, the other way that that you can start building on this is through those peer coaching experiences. So one activity that we did together to sort of begin that know yourself process, and a lot of, a lot of people do that at the beginning of the year. Who, who are you? What do you bring to the table to support our classroom and be a learner and all that kind of thing. So no, after we read Grey Wolf Search or a book like that, you don't have to read that one, we began to look at de this story stick idea. And I actually got that from Lorna Williams. She did it, does it in one of her um, undergrad courses. And uh, I thought, gee, we could make story sticks. And we, so we did it as a peer coaching activity, and Laura actually brought in all kinds of little beads, beads and stuff like that, and glue guns, and, and the kids were just fine with the glue guns. Um, and uh, they, this is Terrell's story stick. I don't know where mine is, but <laughs> anyway, she, this is her story stick, and um, you put little things on it, little artifacts on it that tell us something about you and so the kids could use that as a sharing piece and um, you can have it as part of your celebration or whatever you're doing. So that's just one little activity that they do together as a group, community of learners. And that's just and rich literature. literature and that was us connecting with Lynn's kids a few years back so I took up my four or five class to her older students at, um, at the high school. And these were a group of struggling learners. And they went through the community of learners process and they were doing a similar inquiry than, as we were. And they helped us, they peer coached us with the books that we were reading and doing various activities. And they, they gave testimony about how um, much more focused they were. They did. They couldn't believe how how much more controlled they were when they were working with younger kids. And we've got some cedar trees, a bear, a deer, a rabbit. The first activities rabbit. we did as a community of learners was create a community of learners mural. And this was the first one that we did. And at our school, we're fortunate to have a community center within walking distance that has a beautiful forest with interpretive centers. So we went to the forest as part of our community. And our students were in small groups. And we had leaders at each interpretive center, whether it was one of us. Paige came with us that day. Um, Laura came 
and uh, told an Aboriginal story, and we also used some university students. And so the students, after their learning at the Interpretive Center, they were given um, panels for their group, and they created um, a representation of their knowledge that they learned at a specific center when they did their um, forest community walk. So we also asked them to, they had already adopted their totem animal, to represent their totem in some way on their mural. So that was our first mural and we thought, okay, well, we can't do exactly the same thing a second year. So we were thinking of in our second year, instead of having blocks of, um, of learning, that maybe we ask the students to, for a background, to just represent their learning about Aboriginal culture and tradition and life as the background. And then we had a very creative student teacher who was into photography. And we sort of did this brainstorming session, what can we do now? And her idea was to um, take photographs of the children and then superimpose the um, totem that they had chosen um, over their or with their picture. And so we felt this was a stunning representation of our community of learners and definitely incorporated the, uh, the Aboriginal content that we wanted. And again, we asked them somewhere on their, on their um, panel that they were working on to represent the totem animal <coughs> that they had chosen. And so it'll be interesting for next year, um, what do we do? And I was thinking of, there's an American artist, a sculpture artist, Louise Nevelson, who did box sculptures with artifacts in the box. And I thought, build a bridge. And so you could use shoe boxes, every child builds their box, spray paint them all black or whatever, and then build a bridge and then you would have that concept of, here's uh, my community of learners, and we've made the bridge to another community of learners and connecting the two. But you can come up with um, lots of different ideas for just symbolizing community of learners. And I just wanted to um, share one last book and, and the last page. When my students did their um, community of learners coaching session with um, the grade two class, we, we have done celebrations that have um, involved a gifting ceremony. And so they felt it would be really appropriate to gift something to the grade two class. And so I just bought this book. And they said, we want to give them. And I said, OK, this will be what we will give them. And it's an Iroquois uh, message of thankfulness. And I just wanted to read the um, last two pages. Beautiful illustrations. <coughs> Spirit protectors of our past and present, we thank you for showing us ways to live in peace and harmony with one another. And most of all, thank you, Great Spirit, for giving us all these wonderful gifts so we will be happy and healthy every day and every night. So I thought that was a nice way to um, close our session this morning. We're hoping that as you have lunch, when you come back, within your teams, you might want to start talking about those values that might be appropriate for your school environment and what kind of attributes or characteristics you would want to attach to each of those values. So it's been a long morning. Thank you very much for your active listening and for your input. Thank you.